Okay, folks, uh, thank you very much for coming. Okay, so we're going to switch things around a little bit. Uh, Leo is going to go first, and uh, when Peter gets here, then we will, uh, we will also hear from him. Uh, so Leo Panich is the Canada Research Chair in Comparative Political Economy at York University. Uh, he recently co-authored The Making of Global Capitalism and Political Economy of American Empire, which won the Deutsche Prize. And he is also the co-editor of The Socialist Register. And if I may, just before uh, you begin your remarks, Leo, I'd like to uh, read a poem in, from one of the essays in the... 2013 uh, edition of uh, the Socialist Register. Uh, this edition is called The Question of Strategy. Uh, always an important question, but particularly in these times. And the poem comes from an essay by uh, Michael Spertilakis, uh, who Leo knows quite well. Uh, the essay is Left Strategy in the Greek Cauldron, Explaining Sears' Sears's Success. Uh, the poem is by Antonio Machado, and it goes as following. Wanderer, your footsteps are the road and nothing more. Wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. By walking, one makes the road, and upon glancing behind, one sees the path that never will be trod again. Wanderer, there is no road. Only wake upon the sea. So, uh... Hopeful words from 2013, and now we are very much on a path. We are wanderers, and to help us clarify what that path is, I give you Leo Panich. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, what's already been accomplished by Syriza, we have had meetings on this of the Toronto Left uh, in the last few years in which we've watched their making the road. Uh, and what's already been accomplished is remarkable. Uh, just uh, getting elected is itself a tremendous achievement. Uh, and it shows you the virtue of patience. Uh, this organization did not, uh, this party did not emerge recently. Uh, in some senses, it represents the legacy of the Greek left going back to the Greek Civil War. Uh, and when I was there uh, during the previous election uh, and watched some 500 Syriza members, many of them elderly, hearing the party program before the election in June 2012, uh, and uh, they started chanting, and with elderly people having it in their eyes, our time has come. And you may have seen a video of Cyprus going to vote with some elderly people standing outside of uh, his polling booth saying, our time has come. Of course, you know, that left uh, you know, is represented by two communist parties traditionally. The, uh, the Communist Party of the Interior, the Communist Party of the Exterior, one more closely aligned with the Soviet Union, very closely aligned, the one that broke with that. But the current organization uh, grows out of the Euro-Communist wing of the party in the 1980s. Uh, those people in the youth wing of PASOK who already in the 70s, before PASOK was elected in 1980, recognized that it was not going to attempt to transform the Greek state, uh, would, uh, as with the Socialist Party before the coup in the 60s, uh, would replicate the patronage, the clientelism of the Greek state. Uh, those people came together already in the 80s. Out of that came an organization called Simas Pismos, which has been the largest party within this coalition of the radical left that was really only formed officially in 2005. Uh, but around 1999, 2000, uh, a group of relatively young people some of them who come out of the uh, Communist Party youth, uh, some of them through the Sinas Pismos wing, uh, recognize the importance of the new social movements, uh, especially around the time that the anti-globalization movement was emerging, uh, especially around the time that uh, the new energy was being 
uh, expressed by the ecological movement. Uh, and, and by 2005, uh, that group, which Cyprus was very much part of, uh, was the energizing new group uh, that made the coalition of the radical left a relevant organization politically, not a marginal one increase. By 2008, they already had 15% of the opinion polls. And then the famous student revolt occurred after a young student was shot uh, to death uh, in uh, Exarchia, in, in downtown Athens. And some 500 high schools were closed universities were closed, and Syriza supported the students in that radical revolt, uh, whereas the Communist Party called them agents provocateurs and agents of foreign powers. So, uh, the, the effect of supporting uh, the student revolt was that the Syriza went down in the polls, considerably, back down to 5-6%. There was also some divisions and bickering uh, between the old leadership and the new leadership, out of which Tsipras emerged as the new leader. And they went down in the polls. They used that time in 2009, uh, CNSP is most the largest group within the Coalition of the Radical Left, to write a 300-page program, uh, already conceiving it before the Euro crisis emerged, but the global crisis had already started with the collapse of the mortgage market, the financial industry in the United States. Uh, and and uh, what that meant was when the Euro crisis happened, uh, they uh, had a sense of where they were going, uh, even if uh, they knew that they had to make the road themselves. I'm stressing this because it shows how patient one has to be in order to get to this point. On the other hand, they only got to this point because they were also impatient. Mm. Unexpectedly, Tsipras, virtually telling nobody on the Central Committee, and maybe only after talking to one or two close comrades, suddenly announced in March 2012 with an election imminent that Syriza was prepared to form a coalition with anybody who would join with them to stop the torture of the Greek people. They weren't running in this election to do better in the next polls. That was irresponsible. It wasn't a matter of building up the infrastructure of the party anymore. It now, such was the torture of the Greek people, that they felt it was incumbent upon them to say, we will form a coalition with anyone who will join with us to stop the austerity. And that turned the time. And in the May elections they got 16%. They were suddenly, as people indicated in this, in this video, right, they seemed like the last hope. Right? Uh, and then, by uh, since that didn't produce a majority government, there was another election a month later, just over a month later, and they got 26% of the vote. They came very close uh, to having to form a minority government, it would have been a much more unstable one. And they were much less ready. So some of them were released. Okay. They now, after having led uh, all the Greek parties in the European elections last uh, year, uh, after having elected one of the women you see here, Rena Duru, uh, who used to be a student at Essex University, a student of Ernesto Laclau's people who will know that name, uh, she was elected as governor of Attica, which is the region around Athens, the largest uh, region by population in Greece. Um, that was already an indication of, of uh, how Syriza would do when and if the next election was called. And now they have uh, no longer, they're not, no longer just knocking on the doorstep of the state. They've entered the state. And we have to say that it's, it's, I've said this a number of times since this has happened, it's very sobering for the international left that uh, in this global crisis, this is the sole party of what properly can be called the left, which has entered the state during this crisis. Bolivia, Venezuela all occurred before. It is the sole place in the world where this has happened, and that's why we're all watching it. 
Now, in terms of that marvelous poem by the Spanish poet uh, Antonio Machado, uh, the current, the person who's now been appointed as the education culture minister, uh, Aristides Valtes, who I interviewed for that same volume of the register, also quotes, don't ask where the, ro where the road is, you make the road as you walk. And then he said, uh, uh, the big question is, as we walk, will we in fact be able, and you'll see it right at the beginning of the interview, will we be able, by following step to step right, along that road, will we really be able to find a way past the old dilemma of reform versus revolution without losing sight of the main strategic goal, namely socialism. <coughs> That's where we're at. When I spoke to my friend Michael Squirtalakis, and as I've done a number of times in the last 10 days, two days before the election was going to be clear, it was clear they were going to win. He said, well, now the adventure begins. Our role, the left outside Greece, as I've said before, is not to treat this as though we are members of a cargo cult, looking for whatever ship called socialism is on the horizon and thinking the Messiah has come. We often make this mistake. We often make this mistake. You know, whether it was you know, looking at the Soviet Union in the 1930s because of its full employment during the Depression, uh, but closing our eyes to the uh, show trials that were just beginning of the old Bolsheviks. Uh, we made that mistake to some extent with the Triple Alliance in South Africa the ANC, Communist Party, Kasatu Alliance. Certainly we made that mistake when we went to Porto Alegre to the World Social Forums and uh, would be told about the magical powers of participatory budgeting and how they were transforming the country. We didn't ask the hard questions. It's not a matter of uh, going there with a view to be smarter critics. This is a damn hard thing to do, any of those places. Uh, but but uh, our role is not to become apologists, uh, fable terror, tellers for what's going on. Our role is to try to see the difficulties they're having, to appreciate them, to learn from them. Uh, but above all, of course, to be modest, given what they've already accomplished, given how marginal we are. So we don't want to be hypercritical either by any means. I think above all, in this case right now, we have to be aware of the enormous implications, the enormous burden of responsibility, the enormous pressure that uh, Syriza faces in government. And that is that should this government be stymied in its ability to stop the torture, stop the austerity. Should it be stymied, then the way will be open to the far-right parties in Europe who will say that they are the only ones capable of breaking with the effects of neoliberal globalization. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, this really is a very portentous moment. This awareness, this line that if Syriza is defeated or stymied, I see that Peter's just arrived, uh, that if Syriza is, is defeated or stymied, uh, this will pave the way for the further growth of the ethno-nationalist, racist right in Europe. 
which will say to people, we will solve the problem by excluding the other. Uh, this is now being uh, uh, repeated by Syriza itself. Uh, the new finance minister, Varoufakis, uh, actually said this at a press conference with the German finance minister, Schaub, uh this week. He said that in Germany, he said, I'm going back to not a neo-Nazi party as the third party. It actually did more, less well in this election than it had done in June 2012. Marginally less well. They had one less seat. They had about 1% less of the vote. Nevertheless, they have 16, 17 members of parliament. I'm going back not to a neo Nazi party as the third party, but a Nazi party as the third party. And Germans should be above all aware of what it means if you don't give us the most precious thing we need, which is time. <clears throat> Astonishingly, in the June 29th issue of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs is the American journal which most often expresses, it's an establishment journal based in New York City, it most often expresses the position of the American State Department, at least traditionally, historically, since the 30s, it has done so. It's the Journal of the Council of Foreign Relations, which is a transmission belt between corporate lawyers, uh, academics of the Ivy League uh, uh, area, New York intellectuals, and Washington around foreign issues. And astonishingly, uh, there was an article on January 29th by Mark Blythe, which said the same thing. Which said that unless Podemos and Syriza are given the space to find a progressive way out of this crisis, then it will be the far neo-fascist right that will do so. Now that's interesting. And, and uh, uh, one would like to know whether there's that type of a position inside the American State Department. Certainly what Obama said last week, which was that, that Europe did have to find a way to stimulate did have to find a way uh, to get beyond austerity was significant in that respect, although he didn't specifically talk about Syriza. And what's very interesting is that Varoufakis, who is a kind of Marxist uh, economist, uh, many Marxists in this room wouldn't think so, but uh, the Wall Street Journal called him one, and he doesn't run away run from th that description. Uh, his book, The Global Monitor, which is worth looking at, uh, uh, is a book that, that is an intelligent analysis of globalization under the American empire, The Global Monitor, but which argues that since the 2008 crisis, uh, the United States has lost its dominance, its hegemony, its economic power, etc. Uh, having said all of that, the last page of the book says, when he says what we above all need, is a type of international reform that allows the deficit countries, the countries that have a deficit in terms of their exports and therefore become indebted, that allows the deficit countries to be able to receive finances from the surplus countries. This is essentially what Keynes was proposing at the end of World War II. Uh, it's not that radical a proposal. And then he says on that last page, that only the United States can make this happen. Mm -hmm. Having said, right? now, so when we're looking at what's going on in Europe, it's very important uh, in that sense uh, to also be aware of uh, what kind of pressure uh, the United States might put on Europe. Now in this respect, that's not to say they would succeed. You know, this is an empire that you can't even tell Canada what to do in, in the sense of a colony giving it direct orders. It can put, as we know, uh, nor much more pressure on us than it can on uh, other countries. Uh, but that's not to say they'll be able to dictate to Germany in this respect, but uh, this is the kind of thing that's in, at play. Now in that respect, uh, uh, the fact that Syriza is socialist, 
the fact that as we heard uh, on this video, one of its members of parliament said the first thing we have to do is stop the austerity, uh, uh, but that would give us time to go beyond that. That gives those who, even those, who want to get out of European austerity, who do see it in terms of needing to stop the nationalist fascists who might in that way get in the way of globalization, the way the European right did in the 1930s, right, the way the fascists did in the 30s. They might be hesitant to give Syria a time if it is socialism. And we need to think about that when we get excited and we read uh, columns by Krugman, or, or we see videos by Stiglitz, etc. Uh, because we need to be aware that what they're talking about is not finding a way to escape the old dilemma of reform and revolution. They don't want it to go beyond reform. This came out tragically, very clearly from uh, probably the financial columnist who has taken the most consistent position against austerity in Europe, uh, uh, of all. And his name is Martin Wolf, and he writes the central financial column for the Financial Times. Uh, and this week, he wrote a column which called for all of the things that Syriza is asking for, in terms of time, uh, in terms of the ability to renegotiate the debt, uh, uh, in terms of uh, stimulus in Europe, but then he ended the column by saying, but after this being the first issue, the second issue is structural reform. It's under the name of structural reform that the IMF, of course, has imposed neoliberalism, restructured so many states around the world since the 1980s. The second issue is structural reform. The IMF notes that the past government failed to deliver on 13 of the 14 reforms to which it was supposedly committed. Yet the need for radical reform of the state and the private sector no doubt exists. One indication of the abiding economic inefficiency is the failure of exports to grow in real terms despite the depression. Indeed, Greece far, faces far more than a challenge to reform. It has to achieve law governed modernity it is on these issues that negotiations must focus. So this must be the deal. Deep and radical reform in return for an escape of, from debt bondage. This new deal does not need to be reached this month. The Greeks are right to ask for time, but in the end, they need to convince their partners they are serious about reforms. What if it becomes obvious that they cannot or will not do it? The currency union is a partnership of states not a federal union. Such a partnership can only work if it is a community of values. If Greece wants to be something different, that is its right, but it should leave. What he means by something different <laughs> is something that is, in a sense, also open to negotiation. If he means what Syriza means, that they will do everything they can to build a non-patronage, non-corrupt, non-clientalist state. That's one thing. But if he means that if they hire public employees back, if they increase the welfare budget again, if they stop the privatization, if they seek to stimulate the Greek economy and have a plan for stimulating the European economy through public investment rather than through foreign private investment, if that's what he means by structural reform, which is what the IMF's 14 principles primarily were, then you see that the Wolfs and the Krugmans and the Stiglitzes of the world will be against it. will be against giving it time. Now, this is not something that will be clear right away, like anything else. That's why walking the road is, 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 is you know, so unclear. The road isn't there, because you don't know who you will win as your ally. But I think it's we be, be clear about this. If, if Syria is going to be a sense, a party, a government uh, of the left, in the sense that the Greeks meant the left, at the time of the Greek Civil War. 
right? A, a socialist government, a socialist party. However long that takes, whatever reform is, whatever structural reform in our terms that requires and how long it takes. Now in this respect, there have been some very impressive first steps. As this meeting is being held, Cyprus is delivering his first speech to the Greek Parliament. Right now. Right this evening, uh, as it is now in Athens. And he'll be laying out the government program. And there will be a vote on, a, a confidence vote on that, on Tuesday night. At midnight, that's how they, the Greeks do things. At midnight on Tuesday night. <laughs> What's very significant is that a right-wing party newspaper two days ago published an opinion poll which showed that the government has 72% support. Were they to call an election now, they would win over 50% of the vote. Uh, and they would have a very clear majority of the seats on their own. This partly has to do with sheer national pride. Anybody who knows the Greeks right, know that this is no small element in Greek culture. Uh, clearly, it has to do with the fact that Tsipras and Varoufakis have been traveling around Europe, have been all over the world media, and have been shown to not to be idiots standing up to these guys. On the contrary, right, have looked far more intelligent, urbane, committed, uh, modern, than without their bloody times, right? Uh, than the people they've been meeting. Right? But it also has to do with uh, the extent to which they have already done some of what they promised, and not small things. The cancelization of the privatization of the uh, Piraeus port, uh, that's the port of Athens. Uh, is, is the first step. And they went beyond that. They have fired the people who run uh, the TIPED, it's called, which is the Privatization Commission, the, the semi-public agency that oversees this. They've gotten rid of those people. They may get rid of the agency, but they've gotten rid of those people. They've already hired back 15,000 public servants, and as part of this, and it's, you know, it's been very moving, Varoufakis has said uh, in these meetings, I've hired back the cleaners in the finance board. <laughs> this is symbolically important. They've already announced the raising of the minimum wage. Yes. They've removed the barricades that have defaced Athens. Uh, for really since the student revolt in 2008, but certainly since the you know, Sintagma protest, the Indignado protest, over the last uh, four years. Right? So there are no barriers anymore in front of the parliament if people know Athens. It's right on Sintagma Square, the center square. They've been removed. There are consequences to this. They've also committed uh, to bringing the rule of law back uh, in labor relations. They were, the labor law was completely thrown out uh, in the last uh, four years under the uh, uh, imposition of the memorandum of austerity. Uh, and, and there are contradictions to this. Already, uh, a few nights ago in Exartia, uh, there was a car accident. The police came in, and some anarchists started throwing Molotov cocktails. Uh, uh, if uh, unions uh, take advantage of the reintroduction of collective bargaining in such a way, and why shouldn't they, given what's been done to them, uh, to immediately undertake strikes, this will produce a very difficult set of questions for the government about how much, what to do in response to that. These are the difficult decisions of, 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 of that they face. They've done these things. They're popular. They're seventy-two percent of the support. Uh, it may be higher because these right-wing parties uh, generally are known for writing papers for having the kinds of polls 
which are not favorable to the left in, in the way the polls are conducted. But this is a class struggle. And the class struggle has already taken the form, and we're only talking about inside Greece now, in which the bank deposits have been drawn down. And at first this was reported in such a way that it looked like it was small depositors who were taking their money out of the banks, but it isn't. Financial Times reported this week that overwhelmingly this has been the ship owners and corporate accounts that have been drawn down. Of course, the other side of uh, uh, the class struggle is that the European Central Bank has announced that they will not buy the assets, which the bad assets, the assets that are not tradable, of those banks. They won't buy them off the Greek banks. And the way in which Greek banks, any banks in Europe, get money, and now especially with the European Central Bank following the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing policy, what the Federal Reserve did that saved the banking system was all the mortgages they were holding on to. The Federal Reserve took the bought them and gave them cash. They couldn't get rid of those shitty mortgages. Right? Instead, the Federal Reserve took them and gave the banks cash. That's what saved them. That's is now being done in Europe. The ECB has announced this week that they will not do this for the Greek banks. Uh, but they will fund the Greek Central Bank, as they have to fund it, because where are they going to get money? Right? The, only the European Central Bank produces euros. Right? So you have other central banks across Europe which can't produce currency. Right? So the central bank provides, the European Central Bank provides each uh, central bank in each country with euros. Uh, and and it's, uh, all, they have an emergency fund for this, uh, an emergency loan facility, and they are continuing to supply the, the Greek central bank, and they will supply the Greek banks with euros. Right? But they only do it at a higher rate of interest. Not, it's not enormously high, but it is, it is uh, you know, one and a half percent or so. What's even worse, is that there's a system in place inside Europe that when money goes out of the deficit country banks, exactly what's happening, the ship owners, the corporate clients are taking the money out, and let's say they're putting it in Frankfurt, in the Bundesbank, right, or in the, in the German banks. That system operates in such a way in order to encourage the deficit countries not to run deficits, that they have to pay an interest rate to the German banks, or the banks where the money's going to. Uh, Paul's telling me I need to shut up, but I, uh, I think it's worth, because everyone here is on the left, and I, I think it's, it's worth us running over time. Is that okay, Paul? Make me the bad guy. Uh, well, I don't know. How much time are people willing to stay? <laughs> oh, well, people, will, but people want to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. How many people will stay and ask questions? And Peter will want to talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, make, make the point in the Q&A. Okay. Um, so, we all, you know, will tend to want to play the game of figuring out for the Greek government what to do in this class struggle. And, you know, because of the way the press is treating it, uh, because it's easy to think in terms of, uh, you know, policy uh, rather than strategy, this is what we'll be watching. You know, uh, will the Greeks hold on to some attempt to restructure the debt? They'll never call it default but restructure the debt, and what they're essentially proposing is uh, that uh, the debt they hold, or a very large chunk of it, uh, should be converted by the European Central Bank and by uh, the uh, other central banks that may hold some, should be converted into the type of bonds that you only pay interest on uh, when you have economic growth, or a certain rate of economic growth. Uh, and those can be payable a long time in the future. Indeed, the British in World War I issued bonds which were never repayable. Right? Which you could expect an interest rate, but you never had to pay them back. 
uh, so that's the kind of thing they're arguing for. Uh, they are, and, and this is all laid out by Varoufakis in his writings, and you can just you know, see what he's arguing for. Um, they are arguing for uh, when there's an insolvent bank in any European country, but this would mean in the Greek case, that it be the European stability mechanism, which is was introduced uh, after the crisis began, uh, that directly takes responsibility for uh, recapitalizing those banks. And they, in, in that sense, those banks would become the responsibility of Brussels, not just of the Greeks alone. Above all, they're arguing that the European Investment Bank, which has been around for a long time and has issued bonds for a long time, 45 billion in bonds in recent years, uh, that it ought to be issuing bonds and then handing those funds over to the European member states who need it so they can engage in the massive public infrastructure building that would put people back to work. In other words, they wouldn't then be dependent on private investment for this. On bribing capitalists, whether foreign or domestic, to do it. And their focus is arguing is that the funds that they did, the, in, the penalty interest rates they have to pay the Germans when money flows out of Greek banks, that that money ought to be put into a social solidarity program for Europe, an emergency social solidarity program that would be used for welfare purposes, etc. Right? And if Europe goes through its financial transaction tax, that that would go into that as well. None of this is socialism. On the contrary, you might say that by integrating Greek even further into a capitalist Europe, which is what it is, it would close some doors. If you're going to have economic planning in Greece, how are you going to have it if the private banks are directly responsible to the European Union. So you see the contradictions. They're severe. I think they're worth laying out. It is possible for a European country, even that doesn't break with the Euro, to introduce capital control. That would stop the ship owners, the corporations, whether foreign or domestic, from taking our money out of the country. That exists in Cyprus already. It is possible. Uh, of course, the attempt to do that might uh, uh, produce a very different response in the Greek case because they're breaking with austerity, right? uh, as the Cypriots did not. Uh, uh, it is possible that they could introduce a wealth tax. Uh, this guy, Shaldol, who was the most insistent on, on austerity that Varoufakis met with last week. For his part at the press conference, he said, you need to collect taxes. We will give you 500 German tax collectors. <laughs> well, you could test them. You could say, okay, we are introducing a wealth tax increase. A one-time only wealth tax. Right? Uh, and, you know, we're going to take these guys' assets. That would be a way of testing them. Uh, but the big question still would remain, would that be enough for them? I mean, we're talking about 25% unemployment. This is Depression-era unemployment, which we were spared in this crisis, right? partly because of the actions of the Federal Reserve in, in buying all this bad debt from the bank. Uh, where are they going to get the funds to put those people back to work 50% of youth uh, And to those of you who would like to think that Russia or China uh, are going to come to their aid in a way that is benevolent rather than costly, you're dreaming in technicolor. And I don't think they want to opt for it. On the contrary, they just broke with the Chinese. They aren't going to say bad things about this, they'll say nice things, you know, I'm happy to have your investment, but they just told Costco, uh, not Costco the supermarket, there's a Chinese company called Costco that was running and is, was about to buy the Piraeus port 
and they've just broken that off a month before it was finished. So I think you see the dilemma. But I, I want to end with the importance that we not get mesmerized by you know this plan A or plan B capital controls or you know letting them off the hook, etc. Because the bigger question is this question of structural reform. Uh, how is the state going to be changed? Is it going to be changed along neoliberal lines to promote competition and efficiency in capitalist terms? Uh, is it going to be changed in a way that does get rid of clientelism and patronage, uh, uh, but facilitates a non-corrupt capitalist rule of law? Is it going to be changed in a way that democratizes the Greek state so that it can become a channel of popular pressures to go beyond those types of reforms to turning the Greek state and Greek economy along a socialist path? That's the much deeper question. In that sense, the fact that Aristides Baltes uh, is now the famous socialist philosopher in Greece, is now Minister of Education, is very significant. The fact that Euclid Tsakalatos, who is more of a Marxist economist than Varoufakis, is the alternate minister for international economic policy and has been traveling with Varoufakis around Europe. Uh, he was a student of Andrew Glynn, some of you may know that name, the British Marxist economist. Um, uh, and has written a book on the Greek economy, a uh, very recent one, a very good one. But the fact that he's in the cabinet is significant. Uh, the fact that the woman responsible for immigration policy is one of the leading campaigners for immigrants' rights, for migrants' rights in Greece, is very significant. Uh, the fact that the woman responsible for the Minister of Social, Social Solidarity is a very, very well-known woman, uh, an academic, uh, very left-wing, who has been very close to the social uh, solidarity networks that have been formally been running through the crisis, right, is very significant. The fact that a whole bunch of independent jurists, not members of Syriza, not even elected to Parliament, have been appointed as, into the Ministry of Justice, into being the Minister for Combating Corruption, the Minister of Public Order, these are respected, independent jurists, lawyers, is very significant. Um, but, how many of you remember Yes Minister? That <laughs> wonderful, cynical BBC series. Well, that comes from a, uh, the first paragraph of a memoir written by a left-wing cabinet minister in the Labour government the Harold Wilson government, 1964, Richard Crossman. And he was a left-wing academic. But his, 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 his uh, memoir begins with, I've been, it's already a week since I've been Minister of Health, and oh my God, it seems a long, long time. <laughs> I feel like I've been taken into a asylum and put in a large, comfortable room with very attendant uh, uh, nurses. And they come in and in a very patronizing way, ask me how I'm doing. <laughs> and whatever I say, they say, yes, minister. <laughs> no, minister. <laughs> right? Well, Baltas told uh, Spurdelakis when he spoke to him last week that his ministerial office is larger than his old apartment. <laughs> and Michael Michalis said to me, and i got to tell you, Baltas's apartment is not a small apartment. And, you know, here we come to the old dilemma. This is not a new thing that socialists have been elected into parliament. And there's an old saying. There's more in common between two parliamentarians, one of whom is a socialist, than between two socialists, one of whom is a parliamentarian. <laughs> it becomes very difficult to keep the party going as an active, organizing party as a capacity-building party when you're sitting in that office surrounded by those deferential people. 
And then, you know, the, the people, there's much more appointments in Greece than in Canada to the senior civil service. There's a high turnover, that's part of the patronage. But a good many of the people who've been appointed to act as secretaries of the departments, or what we would call deputy ministers, are technocrats. The secretary of the cabinet is the guy who was acting as the lawyer for this Chinese company in taking over the Piraeus port. But he's also been the lawyer who's been advising the government on how to legally break with the memoranda. Right? Uh, the Syriza government. Right? And he's been part of the Syriza in planning for this for the last year. So there are technocrats there as well. And we need to recognize this. Uh, uh, and, and Michael tells me that some people who've been dealing with the EU and very close to PASOK in recent years, are reappearing again in the state. So the relation to the party is crucial, and I'll end with this. Uh, 45 MPs uh, are now from a uh, group in the uh, party that is uh, very close to, the Central Committee is a couple of hundred people, and there's a group in them called 53 Plus, uh, which aren't part of the far left platform, but are members of the Central Committee who complain in the run-up to the election that Tsipras and the group around him were running it as uh, a very tight not ship, not consulting even the Central Committee, or let alone the rest of the party. Uh, they're on the left uh, while being supportive of the Tsipras type of strategy, not calling for pulling out of the Euro, trying to change Europe rather than pull out of it, etc. Forty, oh, that's a third of the series of members of parliament uh, are part of that group now. Uh, one of them is just about to be appointed as the new party secretary. That's very significant in terms of there being the left in the party being uh, in control. That said, there has not been even a central committee meeting for the last month and a half. Uh, in the run-up to the election, and since the election, since the election, there hasn't been one, although there was an attempt to hold one. The reason given for not having even a party executive meeting uh, was that Cyprus was out of the country. Of course, he was doing all this traveling. Uh, so, uh, I just want to read and, and uh, remind us how Syriza's concluding political resolution went last year, you know, they refounded the party a year ago in order to make it a more committed, visionary, and cohesive party, presumably, for the run-up to the election, but also in relation to entering the government. And their political resolution, which was a 20-page statement that came, that came out of their, their, that founding, refounding conference of Syriza, ended with this. And this, I think, is the real test. The state we're in today calls for something more than a programmatic framework, even something more than a complete program formed democratically and collectively. It calls for the creation and expression of the widest possible militant and catalytic political movement of multi-dimensional subversion. That's why people like Wolf are probably worried. I think, you know, this is a government that has this kind of words in it. Uh, a catalytic political movement of multidimensional subversion that will operate in a spirit of utmost solidarity, elation, and inspiration. A movement that will bring closer together and mobilize hundreds of thousands of people. We are referring to a movement that will creatively unite all the people that flooded the squares and it took enthusiastic part in small and large strikes in towns and villages, etc. Only such a movement can lead to a government of the left, and only such a movement can safeguard the course of such a government. A government of the left has a specific expectation horizon. It carries out radical reforms, takes on developmental initiatives, offers clear environmental and class orientations, opens up new potentials and opportunities for popular intervention, helps create new forms of popular expansion, expansion expression and claims. However, it cannot realize the great changes this country urgently needs by itself. For a government of the left, a parliamentary majority, whatever its size, is not enough. It cannot proceed as if it was a matter of delegation. 
Taking accounts of this fact, Syriza shouldered the responsibility to contribute decisively to shaping this great movement of democratic subversion that will lead the country to a new popular democratic and radical changeover. So, the question is, is the party related to this government in a way that allows it to play the kind of catalytic role that was laid out here? For the moment, it doesn't look like it. There have been some spontaneous demonstrations in support of the government, not organized by the party, 7,000 people, a few days ago, uh, right in front of Parliament without any barriers. And this was organized by the Indignado networks, not by the party, although the party didn't oppose it, and then some of it came along. In some smaller uh, towns in the center of Greece, committees have been formed uh, to support the government. Again, this wasn't the party that got these going, although, of course, they're not opposed to them. Uh, at the moment, the party is more of one. And a big test will be uh, whether uh, this has been the type of party which has vaulted a group of socialists into the state, or it's been the type of party, after 30 years of building, uh, which is the type of party which can democratize uh, the Greek state and Greek economy from below, which can hold these people's feet to the fire, which can renovate uh, 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 the whole of Greek society. Okay, thank you.